me, Jonas Kjellberg. Uh, as you heard, I had the uh, good fortune and um, proportionally good luck of being part of the Skype team. Um, but besides that, today I am a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I'm an investor and I'm an author. Um, other things that I've done uh, than Skype is um, I worked for the Kinevik Group and I did the investment into Salando. I spent about 400 million euros into that company when it was a small company. How many have used Salando here? Ah, cool, starting to get bigger and bigger. Um, and when I did the investment there, I think most of uh, the world basically said, Jonas, this is a very stupid idea. Who will ever want to buy shoes on the internet? But it turned out. I also did the investment into Rocket Internet. Um, I did the investments into HelloFresh, La Moda, and so on. Um, I also had um, the good fortune of being the chairman of the board for a company called iCloud, which I sold to Apple. Um, I've also founded a lot of companies. I founded a company called Nanu Nunuba uh, and Player.io, both which I sold to Yahoo. So if there are any entrepreneurs there and your company is going sideways, you can always call Yahoo. <laughs> At least that's how it was before. <laughs> but, and I've done a lot of more things, but my life has always been basically, how do you change the game? And basically more, how do you fuck up big companies? How do you change the fundamental businesses done? And that's what I'm gonna bring you through my story today. And as you heard, if I'd be here standing on stage, it would be very easy to, for me to talk about all the successes. But what I'm going to spend most of my day today is basically talking about all my failures. Because I've learned so much more on my failures than on my successes. And if it would be a normal lecture, I'd be standing here for the next 42 minutes and talking about what I've done. But let's flip coin this around. Let's make this interactive. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. I often have very strong opinions about things I don't know. I know this comes very natural for you Finnish public to, <laughs> to just you know, interrupt and scream out things. But let's try to be agile and try to change things. And maybe we can start with a, a small quiz or a first story. Is it the big that beat the small or is it the fast that beat the slow? Anyone? Silence. Fast. fast. Hands up for fast. Okay. And um, hands up for the big that beat the small. No one? And yet all the companies, if you read the newspaper, are big. This is actually a trick question. Because this is where my life started, because I was so puzzled constantly trying to understand when does, customer, not, when does companies work, when do they don't work. So <clears throat> after the Skype story, I had the opportunity to actually quit working and I had the idea to start lecturing. So I had the opportunity to go to Stanford and start teaching about my experiences, which was great fun. Um, but after a while, Teaching at Stanford, one of the professors came to me and said, Jonas, it's great fun that you're here. You know, the students love you. You're very provocative. You say what you want. But from the Stanford school, we only have one little challenge with your lectures. Okay, what's that? Uh, we can actually notice that you haven't read the material or the, le the books that you're teaching about. <laughs> okay, fair point. You got me there. <laughs> How many of you have read the American management literature? <laughs> Hands up. Well, okay, quite a lot. But if you do, you can actually, I came to the conclusion, if, if you read the summary in the first chapter, you get it. And then you have like 450 pages left. <laughs> and most of these books are actually shit boring. So you haven't read them, haven't missed anything. But I had to sit down and I had to read all of these books and came to the conclusion, this was boring. So I went back to Tom Kosnick and I said, you know, why don't we write a book summarizing all of these books and all your work that you've done at Stanford? And he thought, okay, but that's a good idea. And I thought he envisioned, you know, this big Bible of entrepreneurship books. And I said, okay, it's fine, but let's write a book that is only 100 pages long with half pictures. So we did. 
Tom was not really convinced, so I said, okay, but uh, let's write it anyway, and let's send it to your, some of your former colleagues. So we sent the book to some of his former colleagues. What do you think they said when they saw this little book? Too short. Too short. Well, brilliant, Tom. You've written a children's book. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 Tom, you know, relax. You know, people don't understand my brilliance. It happens all the time. <laughs> Let's go to the big publishing houses of the world. So I traveled around the world, met with, you know, these big publishing houses. I gave them the book. What do you think they said? Too short. Too short. The children's department is down the hall, Mr. Kelberg. And we basically got denied everywhere. So um, I said, okay, how difficult can it be, Tom? You know, let's just print this book and start selling it. You know, I've started a lot of companies, can't be that difficult. And since I was pissed, we wrote another book. And this book, Business Creation, has only pictures. <laughs> now, we've written the third book, and this book now is published by Wiley, one of the most prestigious publishing houses in the world, published in most Nobel Prize winners ever. Why do you think a big publishing house would change their mind and publish one of these small picture books about entrepreneurship? Sales, yes, greed is good. <laughs> and when that happens, a lot of institutions are actually willing to change their game. And I think this is also what the book is about. The book is about how you drive businesses, but what's in center is customer acquisition. And again, sales is what drives most of these companies. And this is actually where I started my journey. I had the opportunity to start as a CEO assistant for this group, Kinevik. Uh, way, way back. And as a CEO assistant, you cook coffee, you re park cars, you do a shitload of PowerPoints. And when you're done with your first year, which is still tradition today at this Kinevik group, is that you become a CEO of a subsidiary. It's brilliant, you know. I spent a full year with top management. I had a double degree in marketing and engineering. Of course, I should become the CEO of a subsidiary. So, you're all leaders out there. What's the first thing you do when you become a CEO or a new leader? What did they teach you at school? What do we need to have? Sorry? Check for the money, you know, you can go through the balance sheet. Yes, see, man. Yes, that's good. Often, hopefully, it's a lot of customers. I did. Um, and I sat down. And I thought, okay, because what you need to have is a strategy. Yeah? And I was really good at this. So I sat down and I did a shitload of PowerPoints. And then I started playing around with Excel. And this is where it really hit me. Have you ever thought how easy it is to add customers in Excel? <laughs> it's a brilliant tool, eh? <laughs> Bam. Shit, spent five years at the university, never been part of sales, skipped a lot of classes. So in panic, I thought, okay, I need to go back and see when did I miss this about sales because it seems to be important. So I start flipping through my notes, but then it came to one of my favorite books, A. Akers, Swatmull. Have you ever done a Swatmull? Sure. Okay, let's flip Jonas Kelberg in here 20 years ago. What comes out? A lot of weaknesses, huh? So now, if you're a CEO of a company and don't know how to run it, what do you do? Call a consultant, Call a consultant of course. <laughs> so brilliant. <laughs> if I only had the guts to do that at that point in time, huh? I thought this was important. So I thought I needed to learn. And if you don't know, what do you do? You get someone to know, you could maybe hire a guy as well. That's often a good perspective. I didn't have the guts to do that either, but now I know it's great. Either you call the consultants or you hire a guy and then you can actually distance yourself from the guy. So if it doesn't work, you can actually fire the guy later <laughs> because then it's never your fault. Huh? 
But I panicked a bit because, you know, there was nothing around sales. But um, then I had the good fortune. Uh, I met with an old friend, uh, Lars Nyberg, who was the CEO for NCR. And he gave me a small brochure that said, 100 knack, 10 snack, ett tack från en framgångsrik elektroluxförsäljare. Basic saying you need to knock on 100 doors, talk to 10 people before you have one yes from a famous vacuum clean sales guy. And this was interesting because this was the first time I came in contact with something called a pipeline model. But I was an engineer. Sales was not difficult. You do 100, 10, you sell one. You do 200, you sell more. It's super simple. It's like frequency. Yeah? It's more how can you increase frequency? So now this book was really great because when you knocked on the door, you know, when you opened the door, you know, you had very clear instructions how you should put your foot in there <laughs> and you should put your hand on top of it so they couldn't close it. You could prolong the discussion part here. So I was then, so I thought, okay, let's just try this. So we started running up, knocking through doors. But we needed to really push this boundary. So instead of knocking doors, it was a bit too slow. What do you think we invented? Hadn't been done in the Nordics before. This was telemarketing. Hadn't been done. You know, we could take this knocking to a totally different level. Huh? There was only one challenge, you know. Calling these numbers was quite inefficient because you had, you know, dial pad all of these things. So we came to the conclusion, since we were engineers, what happens if we let the computer dial all of these things? And then we could actually dial out to 10 people at the same time. And then we can connect it to an operator. So we started, how do we increase frequency? Huh? Second part here was that calling all these phone numbers was quite expensive. You nearly had to pay one euro a piece to get these phone numbers. So we thought, okay, that's interesting. But what happens if we call all number combinations available? Because the beauty here is that the computer never complained <laughs> about calling the wrong number which the operators often did. <laughs> Until one day when the red phone rings at Muska Naval Base outside of Stockholm, only allowed to be used for the prime minister, <laughs> and the army officer goes, yes, prime minister, what can I do for you, sir? It's like, hey, we're from Optimal Telecom. Would you like to buy some cheap telephony? <laughs> I had to spend nearly 48 hours with the secret police in Sweden, before I could convince them that we were so stupid that we called all the number combinations <laughs> available and that we were not Russian spies. And if they had more red phones on the phone network, we would be calling them as well. <laughs> and basically, this is the whole perspective. And I'm still amazed today, when I meet companies, I buy companies, I invest in companies, how little time and energy the best companies spend in unlocking frequency. 95% of all startups fail. 79% of those startups fail during the growth phase because they cannot unlock growth. When I beat the best Companies that I love to invest in, they've put some of their best engineers in understanding how can they unlock frequency. How can they take frequency to a total different level? And I don't know if this is a cultural thing here from the Nordics, but I did the army uh, up in the Finnish Lapland, and I had this major, Major Kantola. And he said, I Sverige, då kör vi ett skott. Ett träff. Vad är du inte förstår, Kjellberg? <laughs> Then I went and studied the US guys. And they basically just fired at everything. <laughs> <laughs> 
And for me, I think there is a balance. But the first lesson in all the things I've done, how do you unlock frequency? How do you change the game by really driving growth? And for me, after understanding and getting this brochure, the only thing I did when I came in as a new CEO, I started two new companies, a new telco operator that we listed. I started another telco, which I sold to Vodafone. The only thing I did when I came in was I was super happy that you know, they taught a lot of strategy at the university. For build. My life was all about frequency. Then I got a call from a headhunter, and they wanted me to come down and head up a company called the Lycos. Anyone heard of it? No one. And you're an old crowd. Lycos was the world's second largest search engine after Alta Vista. And um, this was a huge company. So I was going to take my frequency engine to a total different level. But what do you think basically happened at the same time? Another little shitty company started in Palo Alto. What does a senior management team and the board do when a shitty little company starts in Palo Alto? Nothing. And when we have done nothing for a while, what do we do then? Panic, Panic comes a bit later. First of them, we make fun of them. They don't even have a business model. How will they ever survive? <laughs> then we panic. And when we panic, what do we do? Denial. denial. Yes, panic and denial goes really good together. Huh? <laughs> it's a great combination. <laughs> really thrives the enthusiasm of a company. <laughs> it's the really the best kind. What do, we, what do you think they did? Well, they thought, okay, maybe we should try to buy this company. When they came back after visiting the company, what do you think the M&A guys in the you know, three-piece suits said? Was this a good acquisition? Anyone? No, the asking price for a company that was heavily in depth and heavily in deficit how could he even ask for that kind of money? Stupidity. And then you can think around it. And we can, we can laugh about this story, but who would ever want to invest in Uber now at the 75 billion US valuation? You think they must own a lot of taxes on their balance sheet. Huh? They have no taxes on their balance sheet. But how I even tried, it didn't work out. Google talked about always delighting the user. And this was something totally new for me. My life had always been always delight the shareholder. They talked about content is king. Then I said, no, 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 no. Distribution is, is King Kong. <laughs> and then I just fell my throttles on my customer acquisition engine. You think it was a success? No, it was an epic failure. So what did Google do? Why didn't my frequency thing work? What did they do? Anyone? They thought about the customer. Yes, they just did a better product. And if you're a simple sales guy, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not OK. Give me a shitty product, I'll sell the shit out of it with my frequency engine, but you do something unique, you change the game. So what they did is they delighted the user. And we've taken this from the hierarchy of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. How, how many you know about hierarchy? Yeah, but it basically works the same way. You know, in the bottom you have the functionality and efficiency, at the top you have delight. Um, let's take an example. This car manufacturer. What's their delight? Safety. safety, yes. Maybe it was, at least it was safety. Now it's, you know, slot on something else. They're getting back to safety again. Huh? But they've been down the valley of death. Now they're a Chinese-owned uh, Swedish safety car. But, you know, they seem to be getting out of there. But 
the interesting perspective here is around more from the, the methodology is that another, take another example, Alfa Romeo, they've had design as their delight, which is brilliant. The problem is if the car doesn't go from A to B, <laughs> this thing falls. Any Alfa Romeo A owners in here? They become less and less. But last time I was here, they had, you know, Fred, Frederico like, oh, no, no, you don't understand. It's a beautiful car. <laughs> yes, Frederico, but it doesn't work. <laughs> no, no, but I get a personal relationship with my mechanic. <laughs> yes, that's uh, some kind of different delight, Frederico. So if you hear that in the sales department, we're building great relationships, you know. Be aware, be aware. But... The beauty here, or the interesting perspective is, during a period of time, when you're adding safety features for Volvo, customer satisfaction goes up. Everyone's happy. But when you have 25 airbags and 26 is coming out for your knees, what happens? It falls down and becomes a functionality. My wife is not impressed that the cars start anymore. For her, that's basic functionality. And this is the biggest question. Because there is no one in the organization that will knock on to the CEO's door and say, hey, you know, customer satisfaction has just changed. What you thought was your delight, what you believed you built your company, is today a functionality. And I see this all the time. How difficult it! I'm still amazed how difficult it is for these big corporates that have all the functionality and all the efficiency to innovate in tomorrow's delight. You can see a people, you know, there's two guys, a PowerPoint and a dog, and they have a clear vision of what tomorrow's delight is. They have no efficiency and no functionality. Take some of the biggest corporations in the world, and they can't in unleash innovation. Because defining tomorrow's delight is difficult. I can give you an example. Harley Davidson had a huge problem during the end of the 80s with competition from the, uh, from the Japanese motorcycles. They were faster, cheaper, better, all of it. So what do you do if you're a US CEO at this point in time? Anyone? Well, they said this was cheating, so they imposed a 10% ban on, t on Japanese motorcycles so they could carry on, you know, raise the Trump flag a bit higher. But they came to halt. It didn't work anymore. So the CEO and the whole management team goes out to uh, a resort and tries to understand, okay, how do we define the light tomorrow? So you can start with a simple SWOT. What comes out? Okay, but you know, we need to have some strengths. What are their best customers? Hell's Angels. Oh, good. Keep that one. That's good. They love our product. Any downside with that? Yes, they never pay the bills. Ah, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yes. But let's keep it there. But what they came up with after that weekend, which they're still sticking is, to, is our delight is what we sell is the ability for a 43-year-old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small towns, and people be afraid of him. That <laughs> is our delight. And this is our innovation intent. It's the 43-year-old accountant. And what they've defined here is basically their friction-free storytelling. I now also work for the Boston Consulting Group as one of their strategic advisors, and I have the opportunity to go around the world and talk to these biggest corporates. And when I came into a room, I often ask a very simple question. What are you selling? How often do you think I get the straight answer from that from the whole board? Seldom. Seldom. And sometimes, you know, they get the mission and vision right, and, you know, life is good. <laughs> and then I say, okay, I ask the next question. And what is your customer buying? 
It's very seldom I get the straight answer. And then I say, okay, oh, but then, you know, Jonas' life is so complicated. You know, we're 15,000 employees. You know, we have different divisions. Uh, okay, but if you're 15,000 employees and you here don't know what you're selling and what the customer is buying, how should the rest of the 15,000 people know what they should be doing? Then you have some companies that basically have a very clear view and then basically, Jonas, haven't you done your homework? But those companies are often the ones on a very, very strong trajectory path. And just to give an example around this, I also had the opportunity to have Stefan Passion in my board, you know, the founder of H&M. And it took him 10 years to figure out the delight from H&M. But what they came up with is, from today on, we're a fashion company with a zero less on the price tag. The interesting thing with this is that they grow a, grew a very, very successful company. This is basically a stock price. But there was another company that were at the same size when they started. I think you have it here as well. Kappal. They never nailed their delight. Then comes another company that grows even stronger, even faster. Sora. Their delight is we're first with the latest. They can copy what's on the runway in New York and have it in stores in 14 days. They sew everything on demand. That's their delight. They're a logistic company. Then I invested in Zalando. They don't even talk about that they're a fashion company. They're a tech company. And I, often, I was in the board and I often complained, you know, about everything was so ugly on the front page, you know. Couldn't we, you know, make it a bit nicer? And then the, the head of fashion there, she just looked at me and said, Jonas, never underestimate the bad taste of Germans. <laughs> she was from BCG. For her fashion was just one big Excel sheet. If I don't know anything about you as a customer, we will serve you 29 euro plastic cowboy boots. But the more we know, the more we'll understand. Because if you ever think, Salando has 16 different products they can show. It's all about trying to understand what is the biggest probability to serve you with a product that you are going to buy on, based on all the different history that we have about you as a customer. So, we talked about the importance of frequency. We talked about the importance of really driving a product that is beyond, that people really love. But over time, you also need a business model. I've tried this a lot of times, you know, selling things without the business model. It works quite long. But over time, you need to figure it out. It's unfortunately true. As you know, I had the opportunity to be part of this company. And when we started that, I'd just been part of this big failure at Lycos. I said, okay, so what is the delight in a phone call, calling from A to B? Oh, it's quite the same. Okay, so how should we price it if we should be very true to our delight? If we should price it really true to our delight, the price should be zero. Brilliant. Good idea. And then Nicola said, well, let's just hold that there. Let's really take this to the extreme. So we started to try to innovate in zeros. Because if the price was going to be free, we needed to know that we needed to do things totally dramatically different. So we started the zero game. A telco And Skype, Telco, loves to in invest in infrastructure. And then we said at Skype, okay, but the beauty here is the internet was getting quite okay. So we said, let's use the internet the customer is paying for. And we found another zero. Elisa, Telia, they love buying switches. Ericsson switches or Nokia switches. But the beauty here is that the CPU power in an Ericsson switch was actually the same as in a personal computer. 
So we said, okay, why don't we call the calls in the computer and then send them off in the com computer that you owned? We found another zero. Then to actually drive good quality around the world, you need a lot of voice over IP gateways. And uh, since I know that everyone, apart one person, has used Skype, we still can convert some market <laughs> share. But how many here used Skype very early on in, in the days? Cool. Can you remember when you came back to your computer without using it and it was super hot and the fan was going at max? Because if that was the case, your computer had become a super node. Meaning that instead of racking all of these servers, we came to the conclusions there was a lot of computers with great CPU power connected to the internet, but not being used. So we said, let's use these computers when they're not being used. So much CPU power. A lot of computers in government buildings, big corporates, you know, there was so much processing power there we could actually utilize. What do you think, you know, my old professor at telecoms at the university would say if I come with this idea yet to him? Or even, you know, go to the Kinevik's lawyer department, and they're quite flexible, I must say. <laughs> We have this idea, you know, we just route this through all government building, you know, big corporates, whatever, wherever we find capacity. But we had nothing to lose, so we did it. Last part was customer service. I knew that customer service could cost nearly up to 30% of all costs in a telco. The challenge here was, I was often more pissed after I talked to Telia Sonia's customer service than before. <laughs> so if that was the case, then there was a negative delta calling customer service. And if there's a negative delta, the best thing we could do would make it to be impossible to call Skypes. <laughs> we didn't have phone numbers on our business cards. We just made it totally impossible to call us. If you didn't like it because your computer was a very bit hot sometimes, you can actually click on a button which was uninstalled and everything disappeared. We were very proud about that. <laughs> we found another zero. And then we can laugh about this, but if you go through, and Tom has gone through many of these big companies that are today the world's most successful companies, they have all innovated in zeros on the cost side. Give me an example. Uber? Yes, they don't have any taxis, they don't have any taxi drivers, and they're actually running a 75 billion company, yes? Airbnb, Airbnb same mythology. Any more? Facebook, really good, they're, you're doing all the work for as a journalist for them, they're not paying a dime for that. They're also quite big by now. What about the company Google? What have they done? They have taken, every night they go out and take the content on every site they can find and download it onto their servers. And then they sell advertising on it. Have you ever thought about that? Brilliant business model. They don't have a cost of content. What other companies have done this successful? What about this company? We can start. Is there any delight flying with Ryanair? You get stand. Yeah, you get stand. But what have they done? I would say they've gone even further. They've started to innovate in revenues. Before coffee was free, now we have to pay for it. Luggage was before free. What do you have to do? Pay for it. Boarding was free, now we have to pay for it. You even have to pay to pay. I don't know how they manage with that one. <laughs> If you don't have a Ryanair Visa MasterCard, you have to pay to pay. Well, yeah, well, that seems to be working for them. Huh? And did they, you know, they even, do you think they get paid? They even get paid to land. Huh? Did they call the normal airport and ask for, you know, 
negotiate down the prices. No, they call a small city airport somewhere and say, hey, could you pay us, you know, two million euros this year for us to land there? And they're like, no, but that's not how it works. That's, that's how it works. You pay us the money, we'll land there, we'll bring you a lot of people, get you the unemployment down. They get their money. Another company that has done this good, what is that? A company that I really enjoy is IKEA. Flat packs. You have to, and the beauty with IKEA is, is how actually they put all the things together. Have you thought what happens when you go into an IKEA store? And then you come here, and then you get in the warehouse, and here you become a warehouse worker. There are no signs here, like from today on now, you're going to start doing what normal other companies do for you. Then you have the cashiers. What's behind the cashiers? Hot dogs. A bull and hot dogs. Huh? What's the cost for a hot dog? 90 cents, yeah. I think it's 50 cents even. And then, but some of these stores are actually franchise. So um, some of these entrepreneurs came to the conclusion, instead of having 50 cents, we could actually charge five euros for the hot dog. People are still devastated after all of this. <laughs> then Ingvar Kamprad comes along. Do you think he's happy? No, but they're like, yeah, but we're making, and we're still selling 98% as many hot dogs. You know, money's flowing in, Ingvar. He's still super pissed. Why? The last thing that the customer should understand from IKEA is it's cheap. And no one should try to put all their furniture into their car on an empty stomach. It's bad for delight. But what's really interesting for me with IKEA is how they put together the whole sales formula. Because how do they innovate in frequency? And how do they work with frequency? It's more about saying, how can we make longer aisles? Huh? That put all these things together. Have you ever thought about, does, do people come up and approach you here and sell stuff to you at IKEA? No, they don't. They're actually told not to. Because if they want to increase their frequency, it's all about how can we make you know, the store so long and complicated. <laughs> and then you become the warehouse worker. How often do you go to IKEA and come home with what you intended to buy? <laughs> you think that is by chance? H47, empty. What do you have to do then if it's empty? Back order. Or you have to come back another day, and what do you have to do? You have to go all the way through here. And then IKEA knows that you'll be coming home with 283 more euros of goods. And then some of you say, oh, yeah, but I've been to IKEA. There are some shortcuts by now, huh? How many have seen the shortcuts? Ha, <laughs> nearly all of you, huh? Why are they there, do you think? Because if you're unlucky, because they've actually taken down warehouses, so there are quite a lot of holes right now. And if you're unlucky, you'll end up in this kind of infinity loop here at IKEA. <laughs> Which is over time bad for business. But what have they done more, IKEA, when it comes to frequency? The catalog. Ingvar Kamprad invented spam. He sent this to everyone. Their biggest challenge now when entering India, they don't know how to actually get enough paper to send this to everyone in India. So, the whole perspective of the most successful companies, basically, how do you integrate frequency together with your delight and your business model, so they all interact and become something totally unique. For me, life has always been 
innovate, don't imitate. This is really, really difficult. And then you can say, oh, but Jonas, you, invented, you invested in rocket internet. They just copied things. Yes, they copied the delight, but they innovated how to run a company and how fast and the audacity they could scale it. So you have to ask yourself, are you a game changer? Are you there? Do you have what it takes to change the game? Or are you just an outperformer? The challenge is these things don't often mix. And if you ever have time, I would say read one book. It's Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma. It's actually shit boring. But it has a very good point. And the point is <clears throat> that this company that invented the railroad that can go up the mountain from a ski lift perspective has so hard time and nearly impossible will innovate the chairlift. Because initially when the entrepreneurs set off to do this, these guys just laughed at them. Who would ever want to go up in a ski lift in a hammock? It's totally dangerous. But over time they developed their product, it became better and better, and over time the customers really liked the idea of not getting their skis off. And the thing is, this is a tenth of the cost of this. Today, we see people flying up the mountains with drones and getting dropped off and then skiing down. They're dying more on the way up than on the way down now. <laughs> but it would be really, really surprising. And I don't think that these guys will event beyond and actually launch that kind of a service. So be very, very honest with your own perspective. What is your delight? How do you innovate in frequency? And how can you innovate in zeros? And then you can say, okay, great, Jonas, this is a lot of mumbo jumbo, uh, <clears throat> a lot of difficult business, you know, how do you run? But what, how can I actually use it? It's not that difficult. Ask yourself three questions What are you selling? To who? And why? Even my 12 year old son can do this, Philip. What are you selling? I'm selling cookies. Okay. To who? The people that are entering the community train every morning. Okay. Why? What's the passion behind you selling cookies? What's the delight? We have to, because it's part we want to go on a class journey. And then his father can't really give up there, but saying like, Philip, but how have you innovated in zeros in this business model? <laughs> and then he thinks for a while, and then he comes to the conclusions, if my mother buys the cookies, I make much more. Thank you. Uh, that was all for me.